Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and horror. Today we are going to unveil the secrets of Rishmuro, a realm full of intrigue, mysteries and horrors that hide under many masks. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that these videos will focus on Rishmuro from the classic Ravenloft setting and you consider the events and characters that existed in the domain prior to the reboot of Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft. At the end of my video coverage of Rich Mulo from the classic Ravenloft setting, I will make some considerations and comparisons with the new Rich Mulo version in the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft. Are you ready? Seeking a cure for our cursed condition of lycanthropy, we search for the whereabouts of the wizard and expert Aurek Nuikin in the realm of Rishmulo. Our quest has caught the attention of the Ronniers, and we are surrounded by rats who corner us and bring us face to face with an intimidating and beautiful lady. She quickly extracts from us a confession about what we are looking for, but after hearing the name of Arik Nuikin, she seems surprised. Rather than dooming us to a horrible fate, she seems interested in helping us find Aurek and deliver to our room a dossier full of secrets and possible allies who could be harboring the elusive mage. Reading her macabre notes and documents, we continue our desperate search and set out to explore Rishmuro's darkest secrets. Our exploration of Rishmuro's dark secrets begins in the city that now surrounds us, the beautiful and opulent Pon Amuzo. The capital of the realm is the largest city in Rishmuro, although most of its buildings are still uninhabited, indicating that in the remote past, the city housed a considerable larger population. An important commercial center of the core, the city is full of artisans and guilds, and their products are exported and carried by ships in the Muzad River to distant lands. One of Pont Amuzo's most striking features is the fact that it was built over the Muzad River, and its buildings spread not only along its banks, but also across numerous artificial islands along the entire length of the river. These constructions on the island are prepared to withstand the flood season of the river, and are equipped with small ports, starways and bridges that connect to an integrated network of streets and labyrinthine alleys of the city that can easily make an individual get lost. Drown bridges allow larger ships traffic through the city, and it's not uncommon to see pulley platforms that take passengers and cargo to street level. Despite the constant movement of ships and commerce in these ports, much of the city is still deserted, and a wrong turn can lead an explorer into uninhabited and silent neighborhoods, frequented only by criminal and other predators. Its opulent, decadent and ornate architecture also hides many crimes and secrets. L'Academy de Richemur is a large educational center in the realm, where the elites can take courses of philosophy, literature, linguistics and natural science. Rishamulo's intellectual elite frequent this house of knowledge, and sinister rumors talk about a mysterious artifact, the Tomb of Terror. This book was sold decades ago by a Vistani caravan to a wealthy merchant in the city, and is richly crafted. The book is covered in an unknown letter and its cape bears the imprint of a human face in agony and suffering. Its interior is filled with countless horror and fairy tales. Handwritten in beautiful calligraphy, but it doesn't have all its pages filled. Those who start reading the book are drawn to some of its tales, and as they begin to read these stories, they and those who are close to the reader are transported into the story. Readers suddenly find themselves in the skin of characters from the tale, and start to live the narrative, 
with all the dangers that these macabre tales contain. Some who survived this experience say that they only escaped by surviving and reaching the end of the tale, but emerged with injuries and trauma suffered while in this state. Those who perish in these stories are forever swallowed by the book, and some claim that new stories appear written in its after these tragic disappearances. The book was much sought after by collectors of Richmond, but is now missing. Some claim that agents of the Kargat have taken the tomb to the Black Vaults of Azani, but its true whereabouts are a mystery. The capital is also a center of the arts, with Le Grand Théâtre de Mozart as its finest stage. Although less popular than the Molu scene, Pont Amuzo is also home to some renowned artists. Among these, a painter keeps a terrible secret among his macabre canvases. Henry Milton always aspired to be a painter and escaped the poverty and violence of his childhood to enter Carina's Academy of Arts. Although he had some talent, he lacked the spark of a genius, and he was frustrated that he would be seen as a mediocre painter at best. He never gave up his obsession, and cruel fate placed him in the path of a sinister artifact. Henry met a talented painter whose paintings seemed vivid and violent. Jealous of his talent, he watched him closely and discovered that the secret to his success was a small ceramic tablet that he used to mix his palettes. Without thinking twice, Henry stole this artifact and fled from Nvidia until he reached Richemulo. Henry's stolen item was the Piccarini's palette, a cursed artifact created in the distant lands of Sri Haji. Painters become obsessed with the palette and come to dislike all their work unless they mix their paints on this object. Piccalin's palette, however, requires its painter to mix their paints with the blood of victims, and then the artists are seized by a fever, creating disturbing, wild and visceral works of art. Those touched by the curse of the palette are also transformed by it, and as they paint, they transform into a hideous werewolf. Each time the painter gives in to the murderous impulses of the palette, their transformation becomes longer and more permanent, until one day it will become irreversible. Henry Milton has been installed for some time in a remote and poor area of Richmond, where he installed his studio. There he attracts models to his paintings, who later become his victims. His grotesque and disturbing paintings are gained fame in the art world but soon there will be nothing left of the artist but a monster as bestial as his creations. Among its ancient, ornate and decaying mansions, the most imposing building is the Chateau de la Nuit, the ancestral home of the Roniers and current home of their ruler, La Grande Dame Jacqueline Ronier, and her closet relatives, such as her son Jacques and her sister Louise. Other less imposing mansions got some horrors that inhabit the city. Yehetier Mansion holds a tale of horror and madness and is a place to be avoided. This mansion was the ancestral home of the Tuvash family, an important noble family of Richemulo. When its master, Sir Renaud Tuvash, decided to get married, he found his ideal partner in the beautiful and intelligent Arabi Dunsani. After the wedding, Arabi Tuvash went to live in the mansion, but found that her husband, although a gentleman and seducer, could also be authoritarian and kept secrets from his wife. Arabi did not have access to the entire property and spent most of her time in the library, where she devoted herself to her passion, studying clockwork devices. One night, Locked in her chambers, she noticed that her husband was holding an event in the house of the state, and she resented him for being the privet of the pleasure of social life and dancing. 
one of her youthful pleasures. Using her skills as a clockmaker, she picked the lock on her door and escaped her confinement. She made it to the end of the event, only to witness something that would destroy her sanity. Her husband and other guests turned it into were rats and devoured some of the last and most inebriated guests. Arby returned to her room in horror. Though driven by madness, she had the coolness and reasoning to think of a way to get rid of her monstrous husband. She bought a powerful poison made from mercury in the hands of an alchemist and managed it to poison and assassinate her husband during dinner. She became the heiress of the mansion, but she never found out where her husband kept his wealth. Abandoned by her servants and alone in the manor, Arabi Tubash descended into a spiral of madness and began to transform her residence. She began to steal bodies and murder people, to steal their possessions, and stuff their bodies to make them mechanical puppets. These automatons were activated by complex mechanisms throughout the house, where they emulated balls and parties, making the insane Arabi company or participating in little traps to protect the manor. Her murderous obsession made her cross paths with a group of adventurers who ended up murdering Araby in the mansion. What would have been an end to this macabre story marked an even more sinister turn as her spirit merged with the mansion, becoming an animator. Now she moves her puppets, doors, windows and traps of the mansion at will while trying to attract new victims to her macabre manor. Another manor holds sinister secrets in Pont Amuseur. Its discreet facade reveals nothing about its interior, and many speculate that it is a secret club for the aristocrat. Careful observers will notice that the house has numerous secret entrances and exits, through which bodies are sometimes transported. The mansion is known as Sans Messi and is home to the headquarters of a torturer's guild. Its founders are fugitives from the distant lands of Harazia, where they were part of the Order of the Scourge, inquisitors in the service of the divine ruler Diamabel. When their leader, Fadi, realized that his mind was occupied with impure talks against Diamabel, he realized that he could only confess his own sins and face the torments, or flee from the domain, and led a group of his most loyal torturers out of Farazia and into the mists. Like many immigrants, Fadi and his apprentice found in Pont Amuseur a chance for a new beginning and installed a secret guild of torturers in the city, selling their services to those who need to punish enemies or extract information through pain. Some of the most outstanding buildings were expanded or renovated on top of the old and abandoned structures found in the city. La Catedrale de Destiné Past, or the Cathedral of the Ordained Plague, is the current center of the fate of Ezra in the city and was built on the ruins of an old bathhouse. Here, Sentir Carelia Duzan commands the fate of Ezra in the realm and the temples are more in line with the sect of the bastion of the mother faith in Borka. Rishmuru's society embraced many peoples and cultures, but Ezra's faith is prevalent in the large cities and among the aristocracy, and offers the nobility convenient means to pose as charitable and also instruments for social manipulation. Rishmuru also became the haven of numerous heretical sects of the Ezra faith, becoming a refugee for those who interpret the holy texts through esoteric and numerology studies. Some of these heretics believe that there will be a fifth great revelation of Ezra before cataclysmic events, and this last sect will bring Ezra's final message to her devotees, finally revealing her grand plan. This view is considered heresy by the rest of Ezra's sects, and most of these heretics have found refuge in the forest known as the House of the Sages in Rishworld, a region known for its reputation for harboring esoteric 
goatist and erratic orders. As with erratics are a diverse group and have everything from harmless vision to followers who intend to ascend to a status of power and divinity as their goddess wants them. The Dancio Divine or Divine Dancers believe they can commune with the goddess divine power by ritualistic repeating her deeds. The Abbe de Flor Luison or the Abbey of the Bright Scourge believe that material possessions are an instrument of the force of darkness and corruption and they take strict vows of poverty. Lavalis, or the Avada heresy, believed that when the grand conjunction occurred, Ezra began to walk again in her mortal form to the lands of the mists, and spared no effort to find a goddess. Another heretical group, known as the Eshonson, or the Cup Bearers, believed that Ezra had children during her mortal life and that her sacred and divine power has passed down through her bloodline. They believe that one of these descendants will one day rise to become a great king and unite all nations toward a bright future. Many of these heretics study ancient texts and mystical signs to try to find this messiah, and many nobles in Rishmuru have already understood the possible political implications and power that can come from manipulating these heretical interpretations. None of these heresies, however, was ever submitted and approved by the rites of revelation, and are expressly condemned by other sects. They meet in secret cults in the middle of the woods. As we descend to explore the forest known as the House of the Sages, we find a place with a haunted reputation. The ancient Tink Noir mansion was once the ancestral home of an important Rishmuro family, but tragedy struck in 721 of the Barovian Canada, and today a huge manor is abandoned and in ruins, covered by vegetation. The Tink Noir were a powerful and eccentric noble lineage, obsessed with the black color, with which they painted every room in their manor. An ancient curse hung over this family and all its members, when they died, became vengeful specters who wanted to murder the other members of their family. Despite this cursed condition, the family managed to survive for decades, thanks to a magical item known as the Bell of Warden, a huge iron bell with a golden clapper whose sound was able to ward off and imprison evil spirits. This bell stood atop a tower of this mansion and was diligently struck every hour to keep these spirits imprisoned in the depths of the earth in their tombs. In 721, unclear circumstances of an illicit encounter delayed the ringing of the bell and the specters and shadows of their ancestors rose and murdered all who inhabited the mansion. Today, the place is abandoned and in ruins, and is avoided as an evil and haunted place. Still exploring these mysterious woods, near the border with Borca, we find La Sanctuaire de la Dame Oubliée, or the Sanctuary of the Forgotten Lady, a chapel in ruins and covered by vegetation that is dedicated to the fate of Hala. The Church of Hala rarely adopts large temples for its practices, preferring woodland clearings and simple altars, but this stone building has gathered into its ruins the symbol of the thirteen serpents of the Hala fate. The place is filled with stillness and silence, and an elderly woman named Balinda takes care of the temple alone. The friendly lady is always willing to talk about her religion, even offering shelter for pilgrims, faithful followers, and priests who visit the sanctuary. Although the ruins indeed are from an ancient Hala temple, Balinda is a terrible threat, and many have lost their lives by accepting her general's offers of food and shelter. Balinda is a cruel anis hag who in the past has terrorized other areas of Rishmuru, but was forced to flee after being hunted by the famous hunter Dr. Rudolf van Richten. She discovered the ruins of this temple of Hala, 
and knowing that this fate was an enemy of the race of hags, she decided to impersonate a priestess of Hala just to capture, torture and devour those of true fate who seek this sanctuary. Coming to the end of the woods known as the House of the Sages, we find a luxurious hunting lodge in the vicinity of Mortini, fitted with servants to meet the demands of the wealthy aristocracy who frequent this place. Founded by the brothers Philip and Jean Paul Gaston, this lodge is home to the Hunting Club, an exclusive club for the elite. The secret club sometimes hire adventurers to capture alive exotic beasts to be hunted, but they also appreciate hunting smart prey, and sometimes capture poor individuals to be hunted in the woods for the amusement of its rich members. While wandering through the mysterious forest of the House of the Sages, take us to the city of Morton, in the south of the domain. The city, on the banks of the Muzad River, is also an important commercial center and is far enough from Pont Amuzel to be out of the constant shadow of Jacqueline Grenier. While in the capital, games of intrigue and power must consider the Grand Lady's absolute dominance and often involve conquering and overthrowing a rival family of her favors. In Mortin, these disputes between families are more direct and daring. The city's aristocracy is always in constant dispute and it's not uncommon for them to become patrons of artists and throw impressive galas to demonstrate their influence and power, while secretly trying to expose their rivals and lead them to ruin. This greater freedom of Mortney aristocracy should not be interpreted as independence, however. In the past, its founders built the seat of government, colored La Estime Capitale, and began to spread republican and independence ideas. The then ruler, Claude Ronnier, was clear in putting an end to these pretensions, imprisoning the nobles in metal barrels and burying them in the mud in the bed of the Muzad River. The city also harbored La Maison de Saint Papillon, or the House of a Hundred Mots, an astronomical observatory that secretly brings together a college of arcane and mystics and function as a school of magic. One of the great mysteries surrounding the city of Mortny is the traditional guard La Seigneur et Clé, or the Lock and Key. The company of Lock and Key is one of the oldest guard companies in Richemont and it remains reputed to be incorruptible. Its guards all wear animal masks to cover their faces and keep their identity in secret. The truth about this company of guards is that the members are all Calibans, individuals deformed by curses or witchcraft, and who found in this stratagem a chance to participate in the life of the city that shelters them. Recent rumors indicate that one of its members, Caliban Roger Le Cauchet, has made a dark pact with a demonic entity to be cured of his deformities and is make offerings to an idol of Baphomet. From the city of Mortigny, we take a boat to go down the Muzad River towards the city of St. Rogers. This ancient city is walled, but its buildings have long since spread beyond its boundaries. All over the city, you can find its monumental arches and gates and its abandoned elevated gardens, colored as Jardin Vieux. The true identity of the saint to whom the city names refer is not known and no religion claims him as a figure of fate. In some point of its ruins, it's possible to see a humanoid figure with the head of a hound wrapped in a halo and bearing different sacred symbols. The city is known for its skilled blacksmiths and the production of armor and weapons is famous. Its population is known for the devotion to Ezra's fate, and in some cases, swordsmiths summon priests to bless their blades at the end of a day's work, blessing their production. The prized Rogier's steel and excellent quality swords can end up being cursed by these religious practices. Rumor has it, 
that whoever uses one of the blessed words to kill a person without provocation or cause will be cursed by Ezra and will wither and die to become a blade rate, a violent and murderous undead. The weapon trade thrives in St. Rogers, and one really shouldn't walk unarmed through this city, whose criminality keeps it on the brink of collapse. The lack of a central authority figure like Jacqueline Rodier and the constant dispute among the nobility have led St. Rogers to become a victim of bandits, gangs and militias who vie for control of areas of the city. The city guard is insufficient to guarantee order, and all kinds of criminal activities can be found, as well as houses of prostitution and illegal gambling. Some point out that a wave of kidnappings has taken place in the city, and that these may be linked to a ring of slavers from Nova Baza. The truth behind this lack of crime control in St. Rogers is the result of the dispute for power between the true masters of Richmulo, who hide in the underground of their cities. No exploration of the secrets of this realm would be complete if we didn't unveil the greatest and truest threat that corrupt these lands. Richmulo's growing population is also home to many werewolves, infected and natural born which make up nearly a tenth of the entire population of the realm, and occupy an even larger proportion of the urban population. The people of Richmulu call them Les Intrus, or the Intruder, and these creatures play an important role in folklore and urban legends, a kind of boogeyman easily singled out for violent attacks, deaths and disappearances, and almost every house in use in Richmulu is reinforced against rodents. The legends don't stray too far from the truth, however. Amidst the sewers and vast underground tunnels and galleries of Richmulo main cities, lurks a secret society of predators with its own social organization. Far from being filthy and savage beasts, were rats are highly organized, cunning and cruel, and are divided into warriors led by a plague king or queen. These warrants are located in the underground of the cities, where its members usually gather in the nests, governor's house capable of housing all its members to feed, reproduce, or for the court of their rulers. Here they bring their victims to feed their members, to make ritualistic sacrifices to the deities, or to infect them with lycanthropy when they need new members for their lair. A well also houses a waste pit, a place full of fields accumulated by these creatures, which is considered sacred by its priests. A well is often heavily protected by traps and defenders, and leaders from different warrens are always vying for power and territory, whether on the surface or below it. This uncontrolled dispute is what makes Santo Rogers such a violent city where crime is out of control, and the dominance of a single war in pont a is what kept it under control. Where rat society is divided in different castes, in the role of an individual in society is usually known after their first transformation, through divinations from their priests, who read their fortune in mold, the movement of rats, or scraps of rubbish of putrid wells. The Tunnel Stalkers, or Scouts cast, is composed of rats who are masters of stealth and survival, and who act on behalf of the Warren as explorers, spies and assassins. Deep underground experts, this cast prefers the solitude of tunnels and the company of rats, insects and other worms. The Dagger Nails The Dagger Nails cast is composed of rat warriors, who live by battle, blood and carnage. Trained to be terrifying combatants, they use unexpected and treacherous combat tactics and sometimes display psychotic and aggressive behavior, even toward other members of their race. The cast of the field breeders is composed of creatures who became users of priest and arcane magic, and they play a leading role in the water. 
these creatures are obsessed with plague and rot, and are dedicated to entropy, destruction, and suffering. Their twisted belief and religion grant them mystical powers linked to disease, decay, and vermin control, and they conduct unholy experiments in the waste pits. Finally, the caste of the skin twisters is considered the nobility among the rare ones, and only those who have absolute control of their transformation fall into this category, living as infiltrators in human society. Generally, only natural-born rarets fit into this category, and some believe that half of all Rishimuro nobility are skin twisters rarets, living as masters of the underworld and the surface. The leaders of a rarity, the kings or queens of the plague, can rise from any of the castes, if they deserve to assume this position. Replacement of a leader is usually through assassination and some of the most prosperous plague kings and queens retain absolute control of their followers, sitting on thrones of human skulls and bones. Our revelations about the feared werewolves and the games of intrigue and threat in which they are involved also reveal to us about a group that opposes these creatures and whose origins go back to the heart of the Ronier family. Not all those who belong to the Ronier family and other werewolf clans became werebeasts. Many humans become companions to werewolves, lying with these nefarious creatures in their human form, without knowledge of their true monstrous nature. Of the children generated by these couples, only a few become werewolves in adolescence. Humans who live among the Ronier and who discover too much or lose their reproductive usefulness, are quickly murdered or became pariahs in the eyes of the monstrous relatives. In St. Rogers, we find the great Honier family mausoleum, where their bodies are taken for their final rest. In this place was buried Simon Aldea, a human and father of the grand dame Jacqueline Ronier, after being murdered by his wife Marie Ronier in 710 of the Barovian calendar. About 25 years later, however, Simon Aldea was raised again from his grave. The twins Pierre and Gerard Ronier, humans who have discovered the truth about the monstrous werebeasts in their family, started a dark and dangerous conspiracy against Jacqueline Ronier and the werewolves of her clan. The brothers secretly gathered in the Ronier catacombs to perform macabre rites and contact a blasphemous divine entity known as the Withered Rat and bring Simon Aldea back to life. Simon Aldea is now a powerful undead, a mummified ancient dead who, under the command of his nephews, has hunted and destroyed were-rats from the Ronier clan. Pierre and Gerard have gathered around other members of the family who are human and unhappy with their secondary role and disposable lives, and created the cult of Simon. Pierre is a skilled warrior and sought in Falkovian two magical weapons that are used in the past to hunt Claude Ronier, the Rapiers, Dogstood, and Cat's Claw. His brother Gerard in turn has become a fanatical worshipper and cleric of the entity known as the Withered Rat, from whom he receives messages in visions and dreams. The Ronier Catacombs are home to this macabre cult, which could become a real threat to Jacqueline Ronier power in the future. The place is magically protected by spells and mystical symbols, which prevent rare rats from entering its tunnels. As we explore the Ronier's shadowy catacombs, we find a hidden room where Gerard Ronier prays to the Withered Rat, taking advantage of the fact that he is not at the site. We glimpse the notes of this crazy cultist, and we see that he has been receiving visions from his divinity about the location of Auric Nuikin, a possible ally in the fight against the werewolves of the Ronier's. 
finally finding a clue to our goal. We swipe the pages of notes and head back into the woods of the House of the Sages. There, in an abandoned tower, we find the hiding place of the recluse Auric Nuikin. A bad feeling surrounds us, as if we are being watched, but we can't back down now. Our travels to Richmond have taken us a long time, and the arrival of the full moon cycle is approaching, and with it, another cycle of transformation into wolf beasts. We enter the ruined tower, hoping to find the wizard, but our haste only leads to being caught in a magical trap. The wizard soon come to meet us, willing to put an end to the invaders, but we implore the mage for mercy, revealing to him that we have come in peace, seeking help to cure our lycanthropic condition. Our speech seems to awaken something in the old wizard, a mixture of suffering, sadness and compassion. After a few questions, we are freed from our mystical shackles and taken with him to an underground chamber. Aurek tells us that in the past, he was a great wizard in Borka. His arcane knowledge attracted thieves, but an arcane accident with mystical protections led to the thief's death, but also turned his wife into a small porcelain figurine. For years he sought a spell to reverse his wife's condition, and finally decided to leave for Rishmuro, where he would search the ancient ruins for an arcane forgotten knowledge. Along with him on this trip came his brother Dimitri, an impetuous young man who needed to be quickly removed from Boca after drawing the attention of the perilous dark widow Ivana Boric. Together, they settled in Pont Amuzor, and he, with permission from the Grand Dame Jacqueline Grenier, began his exploration of the ancient ruins. The relationship between the brothers was not good, and it quickly deteriorated, as Aurek did not trust Dimitri with his secrets. Dimitri, for his part, ended up getting involved with the dangerous Louise Grenier, Jacqueline's wicked twin sister. Dimitri was eventually seduced by Louise, and he revealed to her Aurek's secrets that he kept his wife's porcelain statue in the abode. Louise stole the image from Aurek's house and proceeded to blackmail the wizard into attacking and murdering Jacqueline Ronnier with his powerful magic. The conflict between the brothers and Louise's blackmail culminated in tragedy. The plan to assassinate Jacqueline failed, and his wife's statuette was destroyed by Louise Ronnier. Jacqueline Ronnier discovered the torment Aurek was going through at the loss of his wife, and thought that death would be an abbreviation of that suffering, and both brothers were banished from Richmulo, never to return. We start to wonder why the wizard had returned, even after the Grand Dame threats, but he doesn't answer our questions. The wizard takes us to the basement of the ruined tower and tells us that this place was formerly a prison. Knowing that night and full moon were approaching, he offers us a cell and chains so we can be contained during our transformation. After locking us safely, into our enclosure, he says that over the next few days we will talk about the real reasons for his return to Richmond and about the feared and dangerous Grand Dame Jacqueline Rodier and her family of cursed werewolves. Join us, subscribe to this channel and activate notifications and let's together explore the past and secrets of Jacqueline Rodier the Grand Dame and Dark Lord of Richmond.